Part the Second, The Banquet, Section Two, of Thais by Anatole France. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Banquet, Section Two. At this moment, a strange figure raised the tapestry, and the guests saw before them a little hunchback, whose bald skull rose to a point. He was clad in the Asiatic fashion, in a blue tunic, and wore round his legs, like the barbarians, red breeches spangled with gold stars. On seeing him, Paphnutius recognized Marcus the Arian, and fearing lest a thunderbolt should fall from the heaven, he covered his head with his arms and grew pale with fright. At this banquet of the demons, neither the blasphemies of the pagans nor the horrible errors of the philosopher had had any effect on him, but the mere presence of the heretic quenched his courage. He would have fled, but his eyes met those of Thais, and he felt at once strengthened. He read in her soul that she, who was predestined to become a saint, already protected him. He seized the skirt of her long flowing robe and inwardly prayed to the Saviour Jesus. A murmur of acclamation welcomed the arrival of the personage who had been called the Christian Plato. Hermodorus was the first to speak. Most illustrious Marcus, we rejoice to see you among us, and it may be said that you come at the right moment. We know nothing of the Christian doctrine beyond what is publicly taught. Now, it is certain that a philosopher like you cannot think as the vulgar think, and we are curious to know your opinion of the principal mysteries of the religion you profess. Our dear friend Xenothemus, who, as you know, is always hunting for symbolic meanings, just now questioned the illustrious Paphnutius concerning the Jewish books. But Paphnutius made no reply, and we should not be surprised at that, as our guest has made a vow of silence, and God has sealed his tongue in the desert. But you, Marcus, who have spoken at the Christian synods, and even at the councils of the divine Constantine, can, if you wish, satisfy our curiosity by revealing to us the philosophic truths which are wrapped up in the Christian fables. Is not the first of these truths the existence of an only God, in whom, for my part, I fervently believe? Marcus. Yes, venerable brethren, I believe in an only God, not begotten, the only eternal, the origin of all things. Nicias. We know, Marcus, that your God created the world. That must certainly have been a great crisis in his existence. He had already existed an eternity before he could make up his mind to do it. But I must, in justice, confess that his situation was a most difficult one. He must continue inactive if he would remain perfect, and must act if he would prove to himself his own existence. You assure me that he decided to act. I am willing to believe you, although it was an unpardonable imprudence on the part of a perfect God. But tell us, Marcus, how he set about making the world. Marcus. Those who, without being Christians, possess, like Hemerdorus and Xenothemus, the principles of knowledge are aware that God did not create the world personally without an intermediary. He gave birth to an only Son, and by whom all things were made. Hemodorus. That is quite true, Marcus, and this Son is worshipped under the various names of Hermes, Mithra, Apollo, Adonis, and Jesus. Marcus. I should not be a Christian if I gave him any other names than those of Jesus Christ and Savior. He is the true Son of God, but he is not eternal since he had a beginning. As to thinking that he existed before he was begotten, 
we must leave that absurdity to the Nicene mules and the obstinate ass who too long governed the church of Alexandria under the accursed name of Athanasius. At these words Paphnutius, white with horror, and his face bedewed with the sweat of agony, made the sign of the cross, but maintained a sublime silence. Marcus continued, it is clear that the foolish Nicene creed is a treason against the majesty of the only God, by compelling him to share his indivisible attributes with his own emanation, the mediator by whom all things were made. Cease jesting at the true God of the Christians, Nicias, and learn that, like the lilies of the field, he toils not, neither does he spin. It was not he who was the worker, it was his only son, Jesus, who, having created the world, came afterwards to repair his handiwork. For the creation could not be perfect, and evil was necessarily mingled with good. Nicias, what is good, and what is evil? There was a moment's silence, during which Hermodorus, his arm extended on the cloth, pointed to a little ass in Corinthian metal, which bore two baskets, the one containing white olives, the other black olives. "'You see these olives,' he said. "'The contrast between the colors is pleasant to the eye, and we are content that these should be light and those should be dark.' But if they were endowed with thought and knowledge, the white would say, It is good for an olive to be white, and it is bad for it to be black. And the black olives would hate the white olives. We judge better, for we are as much above them as the gods are above us. For man who only sees a part of things, evil is an evil. For God, who understands all things, evil is a good. Doubtless ugliness is ugly, and not beautiful, but if all were beautiful, the whole world would not be beautiful. It is, then, well that there should be evil, as the second Plato, far greater than the first, has demonstrated. Eucrates let us talk more morally. Evil is an evil, not for the world, of which it cannot destroy the indestructible harmony, but for the sinner who does it and cannot help doing it. Cotta. By Jupiter, that is a good argument. Eucrates. The world is a tragedy by an excellent poet. God, who has composed it, has intended each of us to play a part in it. If he wills that you shall be a beggar, a prince, or a cripple, make the best of the part assigned to you. Nicias. Assuredly, it would be well that the cripple should limp like Hephaestus. It would be well that the madman should indulge in all the fury of Ajax, that the incestuous woman should repeat the crimes of Phaedra, that the traitor should betray, that the rascal should lie, that the murderer kill, and when the peace was played, all the actor, kings, just men, bloody tyrants, pious virgins, immodest wives, noble-minded citizens, and cowardly assassins, should receive from the poet an equal share in the felicitations. Eucrates you distort my thought, Nicias. You change a beautiful young girl into a hideous gorgon. I am sorry for you, if you are so ignorant of the nature of the gods, of justice, and of eternal laws. Xenothemus, for my part, friends, I believe in the reality of good and evil. But I am convinced that there is not a single human action, were it even the kiss of Judas, which does not bear within itself the germ of redemption. Evil contributes to the ultimate salvation of men, and, in that respect, issues from good. 
and shares the merits belonging to good. This has been admirably expressed by the Christians in the myth concerning the man with red hair, who, in order to betray his master, gave him the kiss of peace, and by such act assured the salvation of men. Therefore, nothing is, in my opinion, more unjust and absurd than the hate with which certain disciples of Paul the tent-maker pursue the most unfortunate of the apostles of Jesus without realizing that the kiss of Iscariot, prophesied by Jesus himself, was necessary according to their own doctrine for the redemption of men and that if Judas had not received the thirty pieces, the divine wisdom would have been impugned. Providence frustrated, its designs upset, and the world given over to evil, ignorance, and death. Marcus Divine wisdom foresaw that Judas, though he was not obliged to give the traitor's kiss, would give it notwithstanding. It thus employed the sin of Iscariot as a stone in the marvelous edifice of the redemption. Xenothemus. I spoke just now, Marcus, as though I believed that the redemption of men had been accomplished by Jesus crucified, because I know that such is the belief of the Christians, and I borrowed their opinion that I might the better show the mistake of those who believe in the eternal damnation of Judas. But, in reality, Jesus was, in my eyes, but the precursor of Basilides and Valentinus. As to the mystery of redemption, I tell you, my dear friends, if you are at all curious to hear it, how it was really accomplished on earth the guests made a sign of assent. Like the Athenian virgins with the basket sacred to Ceres, twelve young girls bearing on their heads baskets filled with pomegranates and apples entered the room with a light step in time to the music of an invisible flute. They placed the baskets on the table, the flute ceased, and Xenothemus spoke as follows. When Eunoia the thought of God had created the world, she confided the government of the earth to the angels. But they did not preserve the dispassion befitting masters. Seeing that the daughters of men were fair, they surprised them in the evening by the well-side and united themselves to them. From these unions sprang a turbulent race, who covered the earth with injustice and cruelty, and the dust of the roads drank up the blood of the innocent. The sight of this caused Eunoia infinite grief. See what I have done, she sighed, leaning towards the world. My poor children are plunged in misery, and by my fault. Their suffering is my crime and I will expiate it. God himself, who only thinks through me, would be powerless to restore them to their pristine purity. That which is done is done, and the creation will remain forever imperfect. But at least I will not forsake my creatures. If I cannot make them happy like me, I can make myself unhappy like them since I committed the mistake of giving them bodies which dishonor them, I will myself assume a body like unto theirs, and will go and live amongst them. Having thus spoken, Eunoia descended to the earth, and was incarnate in the breast of a woman of Argos. She was born small and feeble, and received the name Helen, she submitted to all the labors of this life, but soon grew in grace and beauty and became the most desired of women, as she had determined, in order that her mortal body might be tried by the utmost supreme defilements. An inert prey to lascivious and violent men, she suffered rape and adultery 
in expiation of all the adulteries, all the violences, all the iniquities, and caused by her beauty the ruin of nations, that God might pardon the sins of the universe. And never was the celestial thought, never was Eunoia so adorable as in those days when, as a woman, she prostituted herself to heroes and shepherds. The poets surmised her divinity when they painted her so peaceful, superb, and fatal, and when they addressed that invocation to her, a soul as serene as a calm upon the waters. Thus was Eunoia led by pity into evil and suffering. She died, and the Argives still show her tomb, for it was necessary that she should know death after lust and taste the bitter fruit she had sown. But emerging from the decomposed flesh of Helen, she became incarnate again as a woman, and again suffered every form of insult and outrage, thus passing from body to body throughout all the evil ages she takes upon her the sins of the world. Her sacrifice will not be in vain joined to us by the bonds of the flesh. Loving us and weeping with us, she will effect her redemption and ours, and will carry us, clinging to her white breast, into the peace of the regained paradise. Hermodorus. This myth was not unknown to me. I remembered having heard that, in one of her metamorphoses, the divine Helen lived with the magician, Simon, in the reign of the emperor Tiberius. I thought, however, that her perdition was involuntary, and that she was dragged down by the angels in their fall. Xenothemus. It is true, Hermodorus, that men who were not properly initiated in the mysteries have imagined that the sad Ionoia was not a party to her own downfall. But if it were as they assert, Enoia would not be the expiating courtesan, the victim covered with stains of all sorts, the bread steeped in the wine of our shame, the pleasant offering, the meritorious sacrifice, the holocaust, the smoke of which rises to God. If they were not involuntary, there would be no merit in her sins. Calocrates. Does anyone know, Xenothemis, in what country, under what name, in what adorable form this ever renaissance Helen is living now? Xenothemis. A man would have to be very wise indeed to discover such a secret. And wisdom, Callicrates, is not given to poets who live in the rude world of forms and amuse themselves, like children, with sounds and empty shows. Callicrates. Beware of offending the gods, impious Xenothemus. The poets are dear to them. The first laws were dictated in verse by the immortals themselves, and the oracles of the gods are poems. Hymns have a pleasant sound to celestial ears. Who does not know that the poets are prophets, and that nothing is hidden from them? Being a poet myself, and crowned with Apollo's laurel, I will make known to all the last incarnation of Eonoia. The eternal Helen is close to us. She is looking at us, and we are looking at her. You see that woman reclining on the cushions of her couch, so beautiful and so contemplative, whose eyes shed tears, whose lips abound with kisses? It is she, lovely as in the time of Priam and the halcyon days of Asia, Eunoia is now called Thais. Philina. Oh, what do you say, Callicrates? Our dear Thais, New Paris, Menelaus, and the Achaeans who fought before Ilion? Was the Trojan horse big Thais? Aristobulus. Who speaks of a horse? 
I have drunk like a Thracian, cried Chereus as he rolled under the table. Callicrates, raising his cup, cried, If we drink like desperate men, we die unavenged. Old Cotta was asleep, and his bald head nodded slowly above his broad shoulders. For some time past, Dorian had seemed to be greatly excited under his philosophic cloak. He reeled up to the couch of Thais. Thais, I love you all, though it is unseemly in me to love a woman. Thais, why did you not love me before? Dorian, because I had not supped. Thais, but I, my poor friend, have drunk nothing but water, and therefore you must excuse me if I do not love you. Dorian did not wait to hear more, but made towards Drosia, who had made a sign to him in order to get him away from her friend. Xenothemus took the place he had left, and gave Thais a kiss on the mouth. Thais, I thought you more virtuous. Xenothemus, I am perfect, and the perfect are subject to no laws. Thais, but you are not afraid of sullying your soul in a woman's arms? Xenothemus, the body may yield to lust without the soul being concerned. Thais, go away. I wish to be loved with body and soul. All these philosophers are old goats. The lamps died out one by one. The pale rays of dawn, which entered between the openings of the hangings, showed on the livid faces and swollen eyes of the guests. Aristobulus was sleeping soundly by the side of Chereus, and in his dreams devoting all his grooms to the ravens. Xenothemus pressed in his arms the yielding Philina. Dorian poured on the naked bosom of Drosia drops of wine which rolled like rubies on the white breast, which was shaking with laughter, and the philosopher tried to catch these drops with his lips as they rolled on the slippery flesh. Eucrates rose, and placing his arm on the shoulder of Nicias, led him to the end of the hall. Friend, he said, smiling, if you can still think at all, of what are you thinking? I think that the love of woman is like a garden of Adonis. What do you mean by that? Do you not know, Eucrates, that women make little gardens on the terraces in which they plant boughs and clay pots in honor of the lover of Venus? These boughs flourish a little time and then fade. What does that signify, Nicias? That it is foolish to attach importance to that which fades? If beauty is but a shadow, desire is but a lightning flash, what madness it is, then, to desire beauty. Is it not rational, on the contrary, that that which passes should go with that which does not endure, and that the lightning should devour the gliding shadow? Nicias, you seem to me like a child playing at knuckle bones. Take my advice. Be free. By liberty only can you become a man. How can a man be free, Eucrates, when he has a body? You shall see presently, my son. Presently you will say, Eucrates was free. The old man spoke, leaning against a porphyry pillar, his face lighted by the first rays of dawn. Hermodorus and Marcus had approached and stood before him by the side of Nicias, and all four, regardless of the laughter and cries of the drinkers, conversed on things divine. Eucrates expressed himself so wisely and eloquently that Marcus said, You are worthy to know the true God. Eucrates replied, The true God is in the heart of the wise man. Then they spoke of death. I wish, said Eucrates, that it may find me occupied in correcting my faults and attentive to all my duties. In the face of death I will raise my pure hands to heaven. I will say to the gods, your images, gods, that you have placed in the temple of my soul, I have not profaned. I have hung there my thoughts as well as garlands, fillets, and wreaths. 
I have lived according to your providence. I have lived enough. Thus speaking, he raised his arms to heaven, and he remained thoughtful for a moment. Then he continued with extreme joy, Separate thyself from life, Eucrates, like the ripe olive which falls, returning thanks to the tree which bore thee, and blessing the earth thy nurse. At these words, drawing from the folds of his robe a naked dagger, he plunged it into his breast. Those who listened to him sprang forward to seize his hand, but the steel point had already penetrated the heart of the sage. Eucrates had already entered into his rest. Hermodorus and Nicias bore the pale and bleeding body to one of the couches amidst the shrill shrieks of the women, the grunts of the guests disturbed in their sleep, and the heavy breathing of the couples hidden in the shadow of the tapestry. Cotta, an old soldier who slept lightly, woke, approached the corpse, examined the wound, and cried, Call Aristeus, my physician. Nicias shook his head. Eucrates is no more, he said. He wished to die as others wish to love. He has, like all of us, obeyed his inexpressible desire. And lo, now he is like unto the gods who desire nothing. Cotta struck his forehead die? To want to die when he might still serve the state? What nonsense! Paphnutius and Thais remained motionless and mute, side by side, their souls overflowing with disgust, horror, and hope. Suddenly the monk seized the hand of the actress, and stepping over the drunkards who had fallen close to the lascivious couples, and treading in the wine and blood spilt upon the floor, he led her out of the house. The sun had risen over the city, long colonnades stretched on both sides of the deserted street, and at the end shone the dome of Alexander's tomb. Here and there, on the pavement lay broken wreaths and extinguished torches. Fresh wafts of the sea could be felt in the air. Paphnutius, with a look of disgust, tore off his rich robe and trampled the fragments under his feet. "'Thou hast heard them, my Thais,' he cried. "'They have spat forth every sort of folly and abomination. They dragged the divine creator of all things down to the Gemonies of the devils of hell, impudently denied the existence of good and evil, blasphemed Jesus and exalted Judas. And the most infamous of all, the jackal of darkness, the stinking beast, the Aryan full of corruption and death, opened his mouth like a yawning sepulchre. My Thais, thou hast seen these filthy snails crawling towards thee and defiling thee with their sticky sweat. Thou hast seen others like brutes sleeping under the heels of their slaves. Thou hast seen them coupling like beasts on the carpet they had fouled with their vomit. Thou hast seen a foolish old man shed a blood yet viler than the wine which flowed at his debauch. And at the end of the orgy, throw himself in the face of the unforeseen Christ. Praise be to God. Thou hast seen error and recognized how hideous it was. Thais, 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 recall to mind the follies of these philosophers, and say if thou wilt go mad with them. Remember the looks, the gestures, the laughs of their fitting companions, those two lascivious and malicious strumpets, and say if thou wilt remain like unto them. Thais, her heart stirred with horror and disgust at all that she had seen and heard that night, and feeling the indifference and brutality, the malicious jealousy of the women, the heavy weight of useless hours, sighed. I am weary to death, O oh my father. Where shall I find rest? I feel that my face is burning, my head is empty, my arms are so 
tired that I should not have strength to seize happiness were it within reach of my hand. Paphnutius gazed at her with loving pity. Courage, O oh my sister, the hour of rest rises for thee, white and pure as the vapors thou seest rise from the gardens and waters. They were near the house of Thais, and could see, above the wall, the tops of the sycamore and fir trees which surrounded the grotto of nymphs, trembling in the morning breeze. In front of them was a public square, deserted and surrounded with stelae and votive statues, and having at each end a semicircular marble seat, supported by figures of monsters. Thais fell on one of these seats, then... Looking anxiously at the monk, she asked, What must I do? Thou must, replied the monk, follow him who has come to seek thee. He will separate thee from this present life, as the vintager gathers the cluster that would have rotted on the tree, and bears it to the winepress to change it into perfumed wine. Listen. There is, a dozen hours from Alexandria, towards the west, not far from the sea, a nunnery, the rules of which, a masterpiece of wisdom, deserves to be put in lyric verse and sung to the sound of the therobo and tambourines. It may truly be said that the women who are there, submissive to these rules, have their feet upon the earth and their faces in heaven. They desire to be poor, that Jesus may love them, modest, that he may gaze upon them, chaste, that he may wed them. He visits them every day in the guise of a gardener, his feet bare, his beautiful hands open, even as he showed himself to Mary at the entrance of the tomb. I will conduct thee this very day to this nunnery, my Thais, and soon, commingling with these holy women, thou wilt share in their heavenly conversation. They await thee as a sister. On the threshold of the convent, their mother, the pious Albina, will give thee the kiss of peace and will say, My daughter, thou art welcome. The courtesan uttered a cry of amazement. Albina! Bina, a daughter of the Caesars, the great niece of the emperor Carus. She herself, Albina, who born in the purple, has donned the surge, and a daughter of the masters of this world has risen to the rank of servant of Jesus Christ. She will be thy mother. Thais rose and said, Take me, to the house of Albina. And Paphnutius, completing his victory, surely I will conduct thee thither, and there I will place thee in a cell where thou shalt weep for thy sins. For it is not fitting that thou shouldst mingle with the daughters of Albina until thou art cleansed from thy sins. I will seal the door and there, a happy prisoner, thou wilt wait in tears till Jesus himself come, as a sign of pardon, to break the seal that I have placed. And doubt not that he will come, Thais, and how the flesh of thy soul will tremble when thou shalt feel the fingers of light placed upon thy eyes to dry thy tears. Thais said a second time, Take me, my father, to the house of Albina. His heart was filled with joy. Paphnutius gazed around him and tasted almost without fear the pleasure of contemplating the works of creation. His eyes drank in with joy God's light, and unknown breezes fanned his cheeks. Suddenly, Seeing at one of the corners of the public square the little door which led to Thais's house, and remembering that the trees whose foliage he had been admiring shaded the courtesan's garden, he thought of all the impurities which there sullied the air. 
today so light and pure, and his soul was so grieved that bitter tears sprang to his eyes. Thais, he said, we must fly without looking back, but we must not leave behind us the instruments, the witnesses, the accomplices of thy past crimes, those heavy hangings, those beds, carpets, perfume censers and lamps, which would proclaim thy infamy. Dost thou wish that, animated by the demons and carried by the evil spirit that is in them, those accursed belongings should pursue thee even to the desert? It is but too true that there are tables which bring ruin, seats which serve as instruments of devils, which act, speak, strike the ground, and pass through the air. Let all perish which has seen thy shame. Hasten, Thais, and, whilst the city is yet asleep, order thy slaves to make in the center of this place a pile, upon which we will burn all the abominable riches thy dwelling contains. Thais consented. Do as you will, my father, she said. I know that spirits often dwell in inanimate objects. At night some articles of furniture talk, either by giving knocks at regular intervals or by emitting little flashes of light the signals. And even more, have you remarked, my father, at the entrance to the Grotto of Nymphs, on the right, a statue of a naked woman about to bathe? One day I saw, with my own eyes, that statue turn its head like a living person, and then return to its ordinary attitude. I was terrified. Nicias, to whom I related this prodigy, laughed at me. Yet there must be some magic in that statue, for it inspired with violent desires a certain Dalmatian, who was insensible to my beauty. It is certain that I have lived amongst enchanted things, and that I was exposed to the greatest perils, for men have been strangled by the embraces of a bronze statue. Yet it would be a pity to destroy valuable works made with rare skill, and to burn my carpets and tapestry would be a great loss. The Beautiful colors of some of them are truly wonderful, and they cost much money to those who gave them to me. I also possess cups, statues, and pictures of great price. I do not think they ought to perish. But you know what is necessary. Do as you will, my father. Thus saying, she followed the monk to the little door at which so many garlands and wreaths had been hung, and... When it was opened, she told the porter to call together all the slaves in the house. Four Indians, who were employed in the kitchen, were the first to appear. They were all four yellow men, and each had but one eye. It had cost Thais much trouble, and given her amusement, to get together these four slaves of the same race, and all inflicted with the same infirmity. When they attended a table, they excited the curiosity of the guests, and Thais made them relate the story of their lives. These four waited in silence. Their assistants followed them. Then came the stablemen, the huntsmen, the litter-bearers, and the running footmen with muscles like iron, two gardeners, hirsute as Priapus, six ferocious-looking negroes, three Greek slaves, one a grammarian, another a poet, and the third a singer. They all stood, ranged in order on the public square, and were presently joined by the negresses, curious, suspicious, rolling big round eyes, and each with a huge mouth slit to her earrings. Lastly, adjusting their veils, and languidly dragging their feet, which were shackled with light gold chains, appeared six sulky-looking beautiful white slave girls. When they were all assembled, Thais, pointing to Paphnutius, said, do whatever this man commands you, for the Spirit of God is in him, and if you disobey him, you will fall dead. For she had heard, and really believed, that the earth would open and swallow up in flames and smoke any impious wretch whom a saint of the desert struck with his staff. End of Part the Second, Section 2